Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Genius Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm Shelby Jo Long, your host. I have the opportunity to talk to geniuses that have created a business out of their expertise so they can live a life of their passion. Today, it's a special episode because I have the opportunity to not only talk to a genius entrepreneur, but a genius entrepreneur that's going to be featured in one of the events that I am part of hosting here in Billings, Montana in, in August. But I want to really get into the background and I want to tell this story before we get into what's going to happen in the event in August. But Dr. Stephen Long is who I'm introducing today and interviewing today. And we have a few things in common. Not only do we have the same last name, we both have the last name Long, even though I don't think there's any relation, but there is uh, some interesting connections too in our background and our research. We're both involved in higher education. We're both in the leadership communication space, though we have different influence in that. And there's many intersections in what we have. So I'm excited that he is going to join us for the Apex Leadership Institute Summit in August 18th. But I'm also looking forward to future interactions when we have a chance to synergize our work a little bit. So Dr. Stephen Long, welcome to the podcast today. I'm excited that you're here. Thank you, Shelby. It's, it's great to be here and I appreciate the invitation. Of course. Well, let's get into, let's, we just give us a 360 degree view of you and your work and a little bit of your background. And I'll ask a few more questions after that. Well, I love the name of the, your, of your podcast, but I don't know. I, I know, I know I'm not one of them and I'm not really the other one. So I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher, you know, like yourself. Uh, and I know I'm not a genius, but I do hold some intellectual property. So uh, that's, 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 where, that's where it all starts. Sure. Well, that is a product of your internal genius. I would say that. So <laughs> I, I get that the, the word genius has some differing connotations, but you've actually made a product out of it. So that's, that's definitely something that enters your genius into the marketplace. Yes, that, that is true. That is true. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that, more about that. Okay, so um, so I was an education and physical education major in college, and um, uh, I was in an upper level teaching methodology class, and it was really kind of cool because we um, there was there, there might be a like a week of of theory um, in the college classroom, and then we would be sent out, you know, to different classrooms environments. Uh, whether it's in high school, middle school, uh, elementary school, or, or the primary grades. Uh, and so we got a, you know, a full, you know, a robust experience. Um, but I got to tell you, there was this one, there was this one section of the class that I was really resistant. And I mean, I, I told my roommates about it. I told my classmates about it. I didn't want to do it. I didn't like it. It wasn't the population that I wanted to work with, but it had to do with, um, special needs children. And, um, and I got I got to tell you, Shelby, it was transformational. Because what happened was, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, there was physically handicapped and mentally ha handicapped uh, children that we were assigned to, and I was assigned to a low IQ uh, classroom. And they all had, you know, similar IQs, like 60 to 70 IQ, which is, you know, two to three standard deviations, you know, below the mean. Um, and I noticed by sometime in the second week that some of the students were just more patient. You know, they, they, they responded to adversity a little bit more effectively. Um, you know, the, it, when they failed, they didn't get all that, you know, they didn't get frustrated like the other children. And I, and, and, and it, it was a small portion of it. And because, of, or at least I attributed that to their learning, they, they were learning a little bit more efficiently. So I went to my supervising teacher and said, you know, do you know why that is? And she said, you know, she didn't really have any ideas. And so I went to my professor and said, do you know why that is? He says, eh, it could be personality, you know, it could be how, how they're being raised. You know, we, we really don't know. And I was like, okay. And so I just didn't really think about it. So a couple of years later, I was in a 
a master's program at the University of Virginia. And um, my, um, my professor, Bob Rotella, introduced the class, not just me, but the class to a concept called learned helplessness, which was developed by uh, Martin Segelman at the University of Pennsylvania. And what Segelman found is that, well, he was, he was studying and working with uh, people suffering from depression. And what he found is that, you know, some of these people uh, had very low self-esteem, very low frustration tolerance, uh, and very short atten attention spans. And so therefore, he found them to make very little out of their potential. And I was like, ah, well, maybe that's what, you know, those other kids had. Maybe they were learned helpless. But then, like, almost on top of that, like a month later, Bob introduces a concept called learned effectiveness. And it was his concept. And he just figured, well, if you can learn to make the least out of your potential, why couldn't you learn to make the most out of your potential? And I said, whoa. Okay, well, then when I started thinking about those kids, I said, well, you know, maybe some of those kids are learned helpless, but maybe all a lot of those other kids are learned effective, you know, like, you know, the ones who are really patient and, you know, responded to adversity really well. Uh, but, you know, how, you know, how is I going to measure this? But, you know, I was also a member of the coaching staff at the University of Virginia for their football program. And I immediately recognized that even though they had immense talent, right, that some of these players, you know, were really somewhat learned helpless. And maybe, you know, maybe a few of them were learned effective, but I also thought about, you know, some of my teammates when I was at the University of Delaware and, and the year that I spent coaching at Delaware, you know, I said, I said okay, so there's something here. So 10 years later, uh, when I went back to graduate school to get my PhD at the University of Kansas, uh, that was the question that I want to answer. And so if anybody's out there listening who is interested in getting a PhD, don't even think about it unless you have a research question that you want to answer. Okay. Right. And, and so, awesome. you know, yeah, as coaches, you know, we spend a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy, a lot of resources into recruiting the very best athletes that we think they are, the ones with the highest potential. But I got to tell you, Shelby, is that Never, not once, was the, the most talented player our most productive player. Maybe at times they were towards the top. Many times they're in the middle. And even sometimes they're at the bottom. They were complete washouts. Right? So that was the question that I wanted to answer. All right. And so I, I, I just, you know, created this test. And there's a whole process of test development. Um, but it, it ended up being a valid and reliable and fair test. Uh, and so uh, the, 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 that, that was really the first phase. The second phase was developing educational tools. And so, you know, all the scores fell into a bell curve. And what I learned was once I provide tools and strategies for, you know, uh, this is at the Air Force Academy, not only for the, for the cadet athletes, but also for the cadets, uh, whether it be in, in, in athletics or academics or leadership or anything else that they're doing, um, they would improve their performance, but they would also improve their test scores, you know, on my test. And I was like, okay, this is pretty cool. All right. And so the, the thing about it is that what I learned from all that and then, you know, in the 20 or so years that I've been co consulting is that it doesn't really matter where you score in the beginning, the pretest. It just, it just provides a point A, which is important because it, it, it provides what the, you know, what, what the student needs, right? Um, but what happens is that when they go through the program, they'll improve their scores, you know, their test scores by, you know, by one standard deviation. And when that happens, right, then they improve their performance. They, they're just more effective at their job, whatever that is, right? And that's, you know, that, that's where I can predict the future, okay, based yeah. on past results, right? But here's the thing. We don't live in the past or the future, shall we? We live in the present. We live in the now, yes. Okay, we live in the present. And so wherever people are, right, that's where they are, but they don't know it. Right. This is the unknown unknowns. And that's where the hidden costs 
are found because when you go from one, you know, however you're, you know, evaluated in your job, right? And a lot of people are evaluated by, you know, by financial revenue, right? And so when they move from one standard deviation to the next, they'll improve somewhere between a range of 30 to 300% with an average of 115% improvement in financial performance, right? But what that means is where you are right now that you don't know about, you're losing that much money. Right? Right. Those, are the, those, those are the hidden those costs. Hidden, those hidden things, that those hidden costs that we don't understand that uh, hidden, it's not really a cost, it's just hidden lack of performance if you will so yeah yeah well let me let, let me let me help you understand this and, I, and i'll uh, i'll address this at the conference okay yeah. is that so stay with me is that every day not not every day but just about every day i eat the same thing for lunch right i i have strained tuna and i mix in a tomato and some spice and some olive oil okay and you know, it's just easy because, you know, not only when I go to prepare lunch, but, you know, when I'm in the supermarket, I mean, yeah, I just pick up a couple of cans of tuna, right? Because we humans tend to favor things that are familiar, mm -hmm. right? And this, 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 this is the status quo bias is that, you know, we like things to stay the same, right? And so in, 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 at the conference in Billings, I'll show a visual aid because yeah, we kind of understand that intellectually, but we don't really internalize that. And so I have a visual aid that will show this, right? And what it shows is what's called inattentional blindness, right? Is that we don't see what we don't see. We don't know what we don't know. Inattentional blindness is what many people will understand as the unknown unknowns, okay? And so one of, this, is, this is a force uh, this is a, a force of human nature that prevents growth and, and, and change. Right? And it's, this, this is called inertia. Right? And inertia breeds inaction. Right? But this is the reason why people like myself and a lot of other people tell people, tell others, hey, you got to question your assumptions. Because you may not see what's actually there. But, we, but, but human nature tells us, Right, to look for the familiar because that's what we're comfortable with. If I could for just just to respond, there's so many things I want to respond to, but this I think ties into the uh, the entrepreneurship journey in particular. And the, you know, I, I talk about this in, in my book too, the how be how stepping your getting your ideas and putting them into the marketplace, like that's not necessarily that's something that's uncomfortable because you might be rejected and you might be and you might be criticized and that's something that we want to stay away from so there's almost that like mm -hmm. that fear i mean it's a fear of the unknown mm -hmm. and so it, i don't know that's what immediately ties me just thinking about being an entrepreneur and and entering your ideas into the marketplace that's what i immediately think of and, and we're not, the other piece too, that point that really sticks out to me is this resilience piece. When you were talking about teaching in the, in the special education classes mm -hmm. and how the resilience and the adaptation that came from that, I mean, I think that's such an incredible concept. And also that, that maybe the athletes that you worked with didn't have that resilience and how do we, I don't know, it feels like there's that intersection in what well, you're talking about. Yeah, understand that really there's so so the prosperity trait is a psychological trait and there's two types of uh, of psychological traits there's personality traits and then there's character traits. Personality traits are 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 inherited and they're fairly fixed. Now you can you, you can modify those but basically you go back to the way the way you are. Mm -hmm. um, character traits though have to be acquired. You're not born with character traits. But um, the, the point is, is that each trait has a, has a corresponding trait. So in personality, you know, there's introversion and then, and then there's extroversion and we all run along a continuum. Very few people are completely introverted and very few people are completely extroverted. Most of us are somewhere in the middle, right? So, uh, but if you look at, you know, character traits, it's the same thing. If you look at honesty, yeah, we all like to be honest, right? But all of us lie at some point a little bit. Right. But 
this, it's one of the things to understand about traits is that like with honesty and deceit, it's not that if you're in the middle, if you're, in the, if you're, if you're right on the mean, it's not that you lie half the time and you, and, and you're honest half the time. It's sure. just that, you know, where you are in relation to other people. So prosperity, you know, on the opposite side of prosperity is waste. So prosperity is learned effectiveness and waste is learned helplessness. Okay. And so what really is a trait? Well, a trait is it's it, you know, it starts out as an as an idea. And an idea manifests into three forms, all right? Uh, faith, belief, and knowledge. All right. And faith is you know, you don't need any evidence to support something that you have faith in, right? a belief that, you know, there, there is some evidence, right, to support it. And then knowledge is that there's overwhelming evidence, right? like gravity, mm -hmm. right? But regardless of whether there's evidence or not, the more you indoctrinate that idea, whatever it is, right, that becomes an inherited trait. So for like religious people, right, who believe in, you know, the, the everlasting life, right, well, religion becomes a really strong character trait of theirs. Right? Even though there's no evidence, right, I like to think there is, I have faith in it, okay, but, but, that, but that, that's, how, that's how traits are formed, sure. right, ne positive and negative. And so basically the prosperity trait measures a set of beliefs that people have about their performance. Understand I'm not measuring performance, right? That can only be measured in the workplace or, you know, uh, on the athletic field or yeah, wherever sure. it is, yeah. right? What, I'm, what, what we're measuring here is the beliefs that influence performance to a, to a great degree. Because what's important to understand about beliefs is that they determine actions. They determine how we act. So let's let's make let's connect this to leadership and how this prosperity trait index and understanding your character and your personality how does that how does that mesh into your leadership and performance can you make that connection for the audience uh yeah it's uh water rises to its own level Okay, and what's been shown in the research is that um, whether from an organizational standpoint or from a, you know, a team standpoint or department standpoint, wherever the leader is at, you know, because you're, you're, you're measured along these six sigmas, these six standard deviations, um, the group will conform to the beliefs of the leader. Okay, and that can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. Sure. Okay. I'll look at both sides. <laughs> yeah. And so, if you have a leader who's you know is in the upper fiftieth percentile, well, they're going to bring people along with them. But if you're a leader, you know, who's in the bottom fiftieth percentile with more ineffective beliefs, well, you're either going to bring people down, or those other people are going to quit on you. Sure. Okay. That's 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 the danger of uh, of of leaders who are not willing to grow and change. Absolutely. Absolutely. And which is which is why, uh, you know, when you had a conversation with Dave, that was like the first thing that resonated. And then and then just the to talk about that with the leaders of this community and any leaders, I think that's so important, too, because you don't know what you don't know. And that awareness can only improve your yeah. own effectiveness. And I call it charisma. Like everybody has their own leadership charisma. We have different personality traits. We have different character traits. And depending on your audience, it depends on it's how all that resonates with your audience. If you get them to, if they follow you, as, if they're resonating with how you communicate that. And this is just a way to enhance that and makes that, make that more effective. Yeah. You know, people don't leave organizations, they leave bosses. All right? And in my own experience, you know, in my career, is that through my career up until consulting, is I, I had really bad bosses. I mean, unbelievably bad. Yeah. And uh, not all of them, but just about all of them. And what it really came down to was their character. 
right? It had it, it had something to do with my career path, but it had mostly to do with their character. And, and you know, was this somebody that I really wanted to follow? And so, you know, but you know, but but I've had great mentors. I mean, unbelievable mentors. So I've had you know, these influences, positive and negative, you know, throughout my life. Uh, and the mentors had, you know, all of them had tremendous character. And so that might actually just, you know, muddy, you know, poison the water of my bosses. Just, you know, <laughs> these people are so great and my bosses are so awful that I kept on looking for something else. Uh, and I think that's how, <laughs> to be honest with you, I think that's how a lot of people end up in consulting. <laughs> they, they might tire of where they're at. <laughs> Absolutely. So talk to me about your consulting. What type of, you, you know, you've done a lot of work in athletics, uh, working with performance in athletics. What other types of organizations have you worked with in your, with this tool that you've developed and also just your whole consulting platform? Yeah, I, I think there's a total of like 12 different industries that I've been able to, you know, gain entry in. But What's important to understand is that, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher, you mm -hmm. know, I, I really struggle with the marketing and, you know, and I understand, you know, how to keep books. I mean, it's just, you know, adding and subtracting that that's kind of easy, um, you know, as far as the business is concerned, but I had a great experience at the, at the uh, United States Air Force Academy it is only in retrospect that I learned that I was hired to be fired. Um, and there was all kinds of reasons for that that I won't get into, but um, I realized very early on that my customers were, you know, I was housed in the athletic department and I was, I was available to all cadets, but I was housed in the athletic department and my customers were the coaches. If I could get the coaches to enroll in the program, then the athletes would come uh, and then, you know, I would have a sustainable business. And I don't think, you know, the people who hired me thought I could do it. They didn't think anybody could do it, not just me. Yeah. Um, but within a very short amount of time, it took um, cadets, you know, cadets three weeks to get into my office because there is a natural need to, you know, to grow, uh, particularly sure. at that age, you know, to see how good you can be. Uh, and then particularly cadets who are extremely competitive and extremely motivated and extremely talented. When you get those three things together, if they find something that works, yeah, they'll jump in line. They'll jump in line. So I just, you know, built a model when I was at the academy of treating coaches as the clients. The athletes were the subjects. And so when I talk about the prosperity trait as the uh, human attribute for value creation, well, when people move from one sigma to the next, that's when value is created. Absolutely. And whatever that value is in athletics, it's enhanced performance. And, you know, and, and if you, you get enough of them or you get the right ones, teams are going to win. Right. And then coaches like that because they get bonuses. Right. So there is a financial incentive there. The 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 college athlete doesn't really have that, or at least they didn't have that in the 90s. Now they have, you know, some NIL deals that they might be able to leverage. But back then they did. But, you know, they still had that intrinsic uh, motivator for them. Uh, so when I went into the business world, I just applied the same tool is, you know, who's, you know, who, you know, who, who's, you know, who's the client? You know, you know, who's paying me, but, you know, who am I actually helping? Who's the subject? And so that that seems to have worked pretty well. And but it's it's just an educational model. It's nothing revolutionary. I can guarantee that. Well, it's all you. You and I both know that it happens in the application. Right. So it's when you apply it and when you follow it, that's when it happens. So yeah, you, yeah you, 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 the proof's in the pudding. If the tools don't yeah. work. Yeah, uh, it can be a great it, tool, but, it, but if it doesn't work, then it's not an effective. Yeah, but there again, I apply a, you know, a proven educational model is that, 
is that one, I use a pretest and I find out what the needs are of the student. Right? And then I develop a, you know, a, a curriculum, a teaching plan you know, to help that student. And so what I focus on is providing them with tools and strategies uh, to build skills. And when they you know, master those skills, that's when behaviors change. And when behaviors are rewarded and reinforced uh, often enough and strongly enough, that's when habits change and that's when the person actually changes. And then working with the coaches and CEOs and the leaders, then all of those ideas trickle downhill, right? And it, then it just makes everything more vibrant. Well, yeah, well, that's so, yeah, <laughs> because the demand was so strong at the academy, I had quickly, I had to find a way to wholesale this, mm -hmm. to use a business term. And so I started developing leadership programs for the coaches. And so there's you know, there's like four programs for the coaches. There's only one for the producer, whether it's an athlete or somebody in business, all right? But then there's four programs for the leaders uh, because if I can help them help their people, then they're just gonna, you know, th th that's where you, know, you get that domino effect. Absolutely. And that's been shown to be really effective. And I'll be honest with you, you know, in, in terms of, you know, when I work one-on-one -on -one with, some, with somebody, They'll, they'll, they'll improve their PTI scores by two signals. Okay. Um, and that, you know, I just attribute that to just a one-on-one -on -one teaching dynamic. Right. Absolutely. But what, what I do with the coach, you know, with the leaders is that they'll actually, not only them, but their, their, their people will improve their PTI scores by over a signal. Okay. So I'm just wholesaling it out to the leaders and then they're creating an environment through these, you know, through these programs, right? So people can actually maximize their potential because that's, you know, that's what learned effectiveness is all about or the prosperity trade is all about. And that's where I'm going to connect you to connect. We're going to transition the conversation to the event in August, because I think that's the, the thing that we have been really hungry for in this area with the group of leaders in Apex Leadership Institute. We've been hungry for this type of conversation and to have a, a pinnacle to at least organize this around is almost a masterclass for mm -hmm. leaders in the community to be able to elevate their own skills so we can better influence others. There's, I think there's a thirst for it here, that leadership professional development, if you will, to be able to better infiltrate the community and to work better with people around us it elevates everybody so we're excited that you're that you're that you're the first the that you're in our launch event because you bring that perspective to us so this event in august it's august 18th and it's the apex leadership institute launch you're the main speaker can you give us a little bit of a taste of what the institute or what what your platform is talking to the CEOs and the leaders of the Montana community? Uh, yeah. Um, basically, I'm, I'm just going to talk about how the prosperity trade evolved. Uh, that's that's the first thing. And, and then I'm going to talk about these forces of human nature that prevent us from growth and change. Uh, and then I'll, then I'm going to dig into the data is that, you know, for people to um, you know, to, to attend, they have to complete the PTI because that's part of the, you know, the, the only way you learn this is through experiential learning. This is not something, you know, this, this isn't like, you know, you know, chemistry and you're just sitting in a, you know, the re well, the reason why chemistry works is because you have to have, you have to take the lab. It's the same thing. All right. Uh, the reason why math works is because you got to do the math, right? Math is about doing. This is exactly the same thing. It has to be experiential for people to, you know, to engage in. They just can't think about it from a theoretical standpoint. So when I, you know, I talk to people, you know, and, and they've taken the test, they're right with me. But if they haven't taken the test, they're going to be lost and confused because uh, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. And then I dig into the data. As, as far as what the respondents, uh, you know, what, you know, what their beliefs are and what, you know, what they're all about. And then I'll compare and contrast some of the different, um, you know, some of the different groups 
as far as what you know what what their main uh, what, what we call driving forces are the things that are really working for them and some of their points of friction uh and then at the end we're going to have a demonstration about see to see how we can actually you know change those change a uh, a point of friction into a driving force because the, uh, it uh when you make these changes shelby is that you don't you know, you don't just go from a point of friction to a neutral zone, right? You, they automatically are transferred into driving forces. And that's why change can occur so quickly. That's what makes it efficient. There is no middle ground here. Sure. Yeah. I, lo I love the. I'm, I'm very excited for, I love the experience. I like, you know, this is not a typical seminar. This is a seminar. Yes, but it's a very active and it's there. It's growth is happening all across the all across the board because you have not only the pre-test but the post-test and then there's we're, there all of us other speakers are involved in it too to talk about innovation and talk about empathy and talk about all these other pieces that have to do with leadership but having just putting the magnifying glass if you will on us first and our prosperity traits and how we can improve that and elevate our own leadership skills i think is is tremendous and it's going well, to be a great way to frame I, the whole event. I can promise you this, Shelby, is that, you know, I solicit a lot of audience participation and like my New Jersey brother, <laughs> you know, like my New Jersey brethren, Bruce Springsteen says, you think this is a free ride? <laughs> <laughs> you want to play, you got to pay. <laughs> right? and so and so i uh i'm not the only one and 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 i'm not the i'm not the speaker who's tied to the podium i'm not even on stage right i'm i'm in the i'm in the audience right because i need to get their feedback i need to see the whites of their eyes and they need to see me so good i cannot wait and that is something that is such it's such an incredible experience to be a part of i'm very much looking forward to it so am I. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's yeah. not only are there going to be some great minds and leaders collected there from the Billings community that we're all connected to, but it's going to be just an opportunity for us to all elevate our skills together. And you, we have to get out of our comfort zone, not to use the trite phrase, but growth happens when you get out of your comfort zone. And it sounds like this is an opportunity to do well, that. As sure. they, you know, the, the thing about the comfort zone is that as soon as they take the test, they get uh, their report in real time. Yeah. And whether they score well or score poorly, it doesn't really matter. They're out of the comfort zone because they're going to learn something about themselves that they don't know. Sure. Yeah. I need to take it. It reminds me to take the test. I'm going to do it today. Okay, good deal. I'll look for the I'll look for the results. Well, Dr. Long, this was awesome. So many great I love hearing your background. I'm very excited for the event that's going to happen in August. Excited to what you bring to the community and what you bring to the event. Where can our audience find you uh, if they're curious about what you're offering? Oh, uh, my website is longtrainingandresearch.com uh, uh, and and is spelled A N D. And then there's a contact page there and has all the social media as well as, uh, you know, uh, ways to get a hold of me. You know, I'm, I'm freely available. And I'll be sure to include your LinkedIn and your website on the promotion for this page so we can have well, more people you. know about it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, Dr. Long, I'm very much looking forward to seeing you in August and, uh, and experiencing a transformation. I'm looking forward to it. Well, Shelby Long, Shelby Joe Long, my <laughs> sister from a different mister. Uh, I'm looking forward to coming to Billings and meet you in person. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, I look forward to future conversations too about business and, and our last names and uh, leadership because that's what it's all about. So yeah, me, me as well. Thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. Thank you. And to our listeners out there, I hope you enjoyed the conversation of another genius entrepreneur that has entered their whole genius ideas into the marketplace, hopefully to inspire you to think about your genius in a different place. And we will see you next time. Subscribe if you want to hear more conversations about this, where experts have turned their genius into an income stream and a business. I'm Shelby Jo Long. I'll see you next time.